in this specifically because of the other work that H. Bomber Guy has done, which is very well researched, very intelligent, has done a lot of good. I'm going to be assuming that this is in some good faith, that he went in, even if he watched it in bad faith, that, um, that these are his genuine opinions, not things he made up just to slander people. Um, so yeah, um, with all that out of the way, Let's get started. When it was first announced, Ruibi seemed like it was going to be great. It was produced by a darling of independent web content, and created by a legendary animation genius and some of his most trusted colleagues, and written by two... But even with all this stuff in place... Yeah, okay, that's already starting out really badly. <laughs> um... Shane is rather infamous in the Ruby fandom... He wrote a letter that has had a very bad impact and was very entitled and sort of painted him as the one who knew Monty truly and knew what Monty wanted. It's pretty infamous uh, and has had a very long and negative impact on discussion around Ruby. Monty is, of course, the creator of Ruby, for those who don't know. And, uh, he's already starting out, uh, saying, you know, Shane was one of his most trusted colleagues. And written by two. And he, he leaves that hanging in a way that definitely is like, oh, Miles and Carrie are not talented, and they're certainly not Monty's most trusted colleagues. That's what he's really saying. And that's factually untrue. Monty specifically went to Miles Luna and Carrie Shawcross to write Ruby. It really could have been something. And that makes the parts that were good even sadder. Because you can always see what it could have been, and maybe almost was. The show has garnered a pretty large following and a super devout fan base, and it's easy to see why. The show frequently threatens to suddenly become good. People saw what it promised. The pieces are all still there, and sometimes, just often enough for people to keep watching, it looks like they're going to fall into place. But they never have. <sighs> It's been one minute and 42 seconds of this video. A lot of those were just his opinions. And then he says that the reason Ruby has such a big fan base is basically, if we're really putting this in context, that, that we are being tricked into loving Ruby because it could always get good. He may not be intending to, but he's basically calling all the actual Ruby fans suckers. Now, obviously, I'm kind of biased against this show. I'm making a whole video about why I didn't like it. Keep this in mind when I say that Ruby's Red Trailer fucking owns. Okay, so again, this is like a little bit of plausible deniability, right? He literally says, I am biased against this show, you know, but like he's already said, like, you know, people who are actually fans of this show are people who have been led on by the writers uh, because, it, you know, he's already sort of laid the groundwork to buy into this uh, as not just his opinion. And there's like, there's just enough of this throughout the video that people can point to it and say, you know, why are you taking this video so seriously? Like, why does it bother you so much? Which is, of course, why I'm doing this live stream, to talk about it. And like I said, he's already primed his audience a little bit. Again, like, you know, he, he's, he's a little bit pushed his audience, uh, especially anyone who hasn't seen Ruby, in a direction of also being biased a little bit. Like, I want to give him credit for being upfront about some of this, but then the way that this video frames stuff and and the fact that there was already, like, some some moments that feel, like, a little bit 
like priming the audience to react a certain way. It, it feels more like introducing plausible deniability than being up front with his audience. And I don't want to assume necessarily that that was the case, but that's certainly how it comes across to me. Monty was more of a visual storyteller, and seemed to prefer to have writers do the writing part, which means the show has some other important creators, Miles Luna and Kerry Shawcross. Correct. Ruby is being, it's directed by Monty Ohm, uh, and then uh, Monty, Kerry, and myself are the lead writers for the show. Kerry had done some editing and compositing work on Red vs. Blue, and Miles had done machinimating, like the head bobbing to the recorded dialogue, on season 9. He then wrote 13 minutes worth of miniseries, and helped co-write season 10. <laughs> Fighting on Ruby was a lot of fun. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a lot of fun. It to was make. really scary because it was essentially the first time that either of us had ever written anything. Oh, I appear to have accidentally paused that clip. Written anything on original, this, yeah, yeah, or on this scale, on this especially scale, for too. sure. Yeah. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? You, you, it's not the first time they've written anything. So why did you pause it there and make it seem like that was... You're just trying to say they're shitty writers and like... <sighs> and also, what H. Bomber Guy points out here, right, is that Miles and Carrie, they had never done anything on this scale before and they had never done anything of this kind before. And yet he's going to be judging it on the... Like, on how well it holds up to things like Cowboy Bebop and Avatar The Last Airbender. Shouldn't you be judging it on how well people with that amount of experience are... Like, shouldn't you be respecting that they were working from that amount of experience? D doesn't, doesn't that matter to how you judge a show? Or any story? If it's, if it's like your first big project? Doesn't that mean you should have room to grow? Okay, so interesting. So he's really, he is actually highlighting a lot of important stuff here. So first of all, he is up front that Shane is not one of the co-creators. He is up, he is, he's honest uh, about that. He doesn't misrepresent Shane's role. I would also say though, Shane doesn't really go uncredited a lot because his letter saying that Miles and Carrie abandoned Monty's vision is often cited um, by a lot of people. So the fact that, like, the idea that he goes uncredited is not quite true because a lot of people bring him up as a way to say the show isn't following what Monty wanted. So, like, a lot of people know about him. Now, I want to say here, right, like, the whole thing of, like, there's a there's this division of, like, he's, he has this separation between Miles and Carrie uh, and Monty. Like, he uses this as his argument for that. And, like, yes, there was a bit, but that doesn't mean that they weren't working together. And that that is going to be important, I think, to, to remember that just because there was this division of labor doesn't mean that they weren't working together. Eventually, the three of us all decided on a few set rules and characters mm -hmm. and um, story ideas that we wanted to stick to. Monty's working on, like, action and, like, the d design and the look of the show. And he kind of ha had us go off and start writing uh, the first episode. Yeah. This division of work does seem to make sense on the surface. However, something Miles is being nice and not mentioning is that sometimes Monty would just disappear and then come up with new characters story elements and action sequences which the writers would then suddenly have to make room for in their script uh like that's pretty important to you judging the quality of the writing so like blaming like putting putting anything you don't like about the first three volumes purely on on miles and carrie's shoulders is going to be or at the very least should be undermined by what you just said about Monty coming up with new ideas and Miles and Carrie having to deal with them. 